Good morning to everyone. Um, I would like to, first of all, tell Annette that she's not the only one that comes from a VET uh, pathway, because in fact, I'm always very proud of saying that uh, I myself studied a VET qualification. And the VET qualification I had at the time shows you how much the labor market has changed. Back in 1970s, I took a VET qualification as a radio technician. Can you believe it? At that moment, we had people that had a profession of just fixing radios. Inside the radios had these very big valves that looked like lamps, and that was what I aspired to do as a profession. Today, I work in Brussels at the European Commission dealing with vocational education and training policy. But just shows you how much the labor market changes. In 1976, there were real professions on that. But Annette, so you're not the only one having a background on VET. Uh, but that also brings us more closer together. Now, uh, these three days, I think it's been very interesting, but you basically have been comfortably just sitting there and listening to various lectures. We heard uh, George Arevalo with his visionary uh, uh, outlook of where VET is going in the Basque country and what they're doing about it. We heard Mark Vidal, a futurist, uh, telling us all the changes that are happening out there. Then we had Dana Bachman and uh, Steve also telling us what are their visions of the way in which we should be looking at VET in the future. And we had Annette giving us the example of the US. What we will do in the next uh, hour or so is allow you to interact and I'll tell you how in a few minutes. We'll have an app. I hope you all have uh, mobile phones and hopefully also connected to the internet. In uh, uh, Kursal, there is um, Wi-Fi available, so if you can just connect to the internet, because I'm going to ask you to then just go into a website and log in so that you can respond to some questions. And you can also start preparing questions you'd like to uh, present to our panel, because you'll have the opportunity to do it during uh, uh, this session. Before I start, can I just ask you, how many people in the audience are from outside Europe? Can you just raise your hand so that I get a feeling? Okay, so we have around a third of the people come from outside uh, the European Union. Fine, so I will maybe start, before I get to ask the panelists to present each other, I will maybe just pass a quick video. I'm not going to give you any lecture, there's no PowerPoint from me, don't worry. And I'm just going to uh, ask our uh, colleagues to please put the first video I'd like to share with you. It's of a, f a futurist telling us what is his vision of in what direction we are going in society. Please, can you put the first video? Once upon a time, business as usual was often good enough. No more. Where we are going, good enough is dead. In a world where everything is connected, where everything is equally excellent, where performance is reaching perfection, there's only one space left to innovate in. You. Right now, you are a central point in the raging tornado of change fueled by digitization, mobilization, augmentation, disintermediation, automation. Well, the list goes on. Science fiction is becoming science fact. Think about self-driving cars or computers that can learn and think. The way we work will never be the same. The skills we need will be dramatically different. Winning or losing are now happening faster than ever before. So what's your response? How will you discover new opportunities in one of the most transformational times in human history? Are you driving change or are you being driven by it? Disruption has become the new normal. With change, it's always gradually, then suddenly, well, things really have stopped happening gradually. This change is exponential. Everything that used to be dumb and disconnected is now wired and intelligent. Cars, cities, ports, farms, even our bodies will be wired with sensors and will talk to each other. These game changers are also combinatorial. They amplify each other, creating a perfect storm of change. Quantum computing fuels big data. The Internet of Things fuels artificial intelligence and deep learning, which fuels robotics. However, anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become extremely valuable. Human-only traits such as creativity, imagination, intuition, emotion and ethics 
will be even more important in the future because machines are very good at simulating but not at being. Yes, robots and software will do some of our work, but this will allow us to focus on things that cannot be automated. To imagine change squared, you've got to start engaging more with what might be, not just with what is. Immerse yourself in the immediate future, five to seven years out from today. We need to go beyond technology and data to reach human insights and wisdom. Technology represents the how of change, but humans represent the why. The future is about holistic business model. The opportunity is to be liquid, to learn just in time, not just in case, not single improvements, but complete transformations, not individual systems, but new ecosystems. Humanity is where true and lasting value is created. We will engage late and buy things because of the experiences they provide, because of their transformative power. The future doesn't just happen, the future gets happened. The new way to work is to embrace technology, but not to become it. The future is in technology, yet the bigger future lies in transcending it. Let's live and lead from here. Okay, I, I thought of passing this video because on the one hand it's a little bit frightening, the, 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 the speed of change, and it really alerts us to, to embrace change and to do something about it, but I think it has also a very a good message in the sense that, you know, technology is the future, but in fact, it's humans, it's us, it's our qualities that are unique, like our ethical values, like our capacity to have emotion. Those are the traits that we should never be afraid of because it will be extremely difficult for machines to replace, and those are the traits that maybe we should be focusing more. But I just put this on to provoke a little bit the kind of, uh, of discussion I'd like to have today with the panel. And the first thing I'll do, we have six people here that represents international network on vocational education and training. And the first part will be a short presentation. I'd like to ask each of you if you could please just present yourself, your organization, what you are doing in the area of VET. Please, uh, Hans. You have a mic? Okay. Uh, there's a mic there, but you can use Okay. This one is, yeah, right. Thank you very much. My name is Hans Lehmann. I am vice principal at a regional college in Denmark. At least that's where I get my pay from, but anyway. Um, I've been in the vocational area for almost 30 years, and um, I think that this is a fantastic opportunity to be here and want to thank the Basque government and Technica for inviting us to be here. It's a very amazing program I've seen over the last days, and it's also very important issues that we have covered. I'm here representing TA3, Transatlantic Training and Technology, an American European organization that has been around for 25 years. And we are sharing uh, projects, uh, exchanges, and also learning from each other across the ocean. Um, from January or from February this year, I'm also vice president for policy and effort, but I'll leave that to Santiago. He'll be there in a minute. But thank you for Dana and Hao for sharing information about the future of VET. I think things are looking very, very promising from what you presented to us yesterday. Thank you, please. Good morning. My name is Jens Liebe. I uh, work for UNESCO Univoc, uh, which is an international center of UNESCO, um, specialized on supporting member states uh, to improve their VET system. We do that uh, through the Univoc network, uh, which is an international network of a variety of different uh, VET or, uh, or organizations and institutions uh, working in VET. Currently, we have a membership of about 250 institutions from about 165 member states, and they cover the whole range of, uh, of the VET system. So they can be ministries, they can be national bodies, they can be from universities or research domain, 
uh, or they can be uh, training providers. Uh, together with this network, uh, we try to uh, foster youth, uh, youth employment and entrepreneurship. Uh, a second priority that we work on is to promote equity and gender equality. Uh, and the uh, third one is uh, facilitating the transition to uh, green economies and sustainable societies, which also includes uh, elements of digitalization and industry 4.0. Um, I think with that, I'll pass on. Thank you. Thank you. Denise, please. This is short. So I'm Denise Emio. Uh, in my day-to-day uh, -day life, I'm the president of a national association of all the colleges, the polytechnics, and the CEGEPs in Canada. And in my volunteer capacity, I represent the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics. I'm the past president, and I'm on the board. And uh, so what is the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics? I do have information if you want to become a member here. Um, it is for both network of institutions, so for associations like mine, or institutions themselves, or individuals. And why is it important to be a member of the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics? It's because it provides a network a network from all over the world. So not only Europe or not only North America or South America or Asia, all over the world. Uh, why is it important? You all know sharing best practices, learning from each other, as well as collaborating on some given project. So very, very quickly, World Congress every two years. Next one is in October in Australia. We have international awards, uh, the only one in the world that are not specifically for students. So opportunity to say that whatever you do is, has been recognized internationally. Uh, we have affinity groups ranging from affinity groups in applied research to access to uh, sustainability development. Um, we have youth leadership camp also that is really interesting for youth and uh, an executive leadership program of two days when we hold the World Congress. And uh, we will publish in a couple of weeks our second publications of a guide of best practices that are all the winners of the international award. So because of time, I will stop here. I'll just say that we are a 20 years old uh, organization, and it's really fun to be a member. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's difficult after Denise. Uh, my name is Santiago Garcia, I'm from Spain. I work in Spain for the Spanish Confederation of Private Schools, but I'm here representing EFED, the European Forum of Vocational Education and Training. It's one of the six European vet and higher education providers association that we together, Alicia is also with Russia, we together and we, the commission have a platform of vet providers called vet for u 2 EFED is a uh, in 24 countries in Europe, and we have also members outside Europe in Russia and Hong Kong, for instance. We represent more or less 1,500 vet providers. We are, a, we are a vet providers organization. It was created for and by, by vet, vet providers. Our main aim is to connect people. We provide a network of connections with all the relevant stakeholders in the European Union and beyond. And uh, we participate in many Erasmus Plus projects. Some of you here are members of our organization. And we also create thematic networks to exchange of knowledge and best practices. And as part of that uh, European platform of VET providers, we are representing most of you, the VET providers, in all the working groups of the European Union, the working group on VET, the equality system, the credit system, EQF, the set of working groups, uh, long life learning platform, all the forums where decisions are made regarding VET in Europe. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thanks to Technica to be here, to uh, have those three days, very interesting, and to learn a lot. But it's now about vocational education training. My name is uh, Hans Dahle. I'm uh, from uh, the Netherlands, Holland, and um, I'm a manager for a lifelong learning network over there, but I'm representing here Chain5. Um, Chain5 is um, 
a community of practice for level five qualifications. Not political, not strategical, it's more about the practical issues. And in 2010, we already discovered that there was more and more attention needed for level five qualifications. In 2008, the European Qualifications Framework was adopted, so it was more clear about levels and degrees and cycles. So that in 2013, we started to have chain five, and five, of course, is the level five of the European Qualifications Framework. Uh, in national issues, it can be different, in like in England, level six, something like that. We are connecting level four, level five, level five, and level six. But it's not just about formal or non-formal. It's non-credit or credit or private or public finance. It can be offered qualifications by business academies, the world of work, professional bodies, Fed providers and higher education providers. So it's the whole spectrum for what we have in level five. People thinking of level five, then it may be formal. And then the second is that it's higher education. So you'll come back to that. But we are very happy to have the European uh, strategy now level five that the ministers adopted short cycle higher education and said already respect also qualifications offered by FED providers or business academies, recognition of prior learning. So that is very important and now we have the fifth anniversary. Next year we'll start with thinking about the new process. What can we do at chain five? Membership is for free, but you're paying in time, in energy, and motivation if you be a member of Chain 5. Thank you. So, hello from my side as well. I'm Alicia Leonor Sauli Miklaucic. I'm from Slovenia, and I'm the board member of Eurashi. Eurashi is a European Association of Higher Education Institutions. Uh, universities of Applied Sciences, community colleges, institutions of Applied Sciences. It is mostly an association of national associations, but also institutions are our members. We have uh, over 1,400 members uh, all across Europe and around the world. We are only missing, uh, we have a blank spot in Latin America, so as there are many <laughs> representatives here from Latin America, welcome. Uh, why we are here as we are higher education? Well, Eurasia found out in uh, the years that higher education has developed and evolved into two different parallel uh, uh, pillars. And we call it academic uh, higher education and professional higher education. There is a very high demand from the world of work for high profile graduates, but with practical and really, uh, let us say, work oriented knowledge, applied knowledge that they can really apply immediately. So not just knowledge, but really competences. And this is why Russia concentrated very much into professional education, working to <coughs> together with the world of work. And this is what connects us. So DG employment, we are employment oriented, but of course, with the responsibility to give our graduates also the broader knowledge for the future. Thank you. So now we go into the tricky part in which I will uh, need your cooperation in running this, um, uh, this session. In the sense that if you could please uh, pull out your phones, your mobile phones or your computer. Can we put the web? Uh, Jose, can we put the web? Okay. So you have to go to that website, www.menti.com, and then it will ask you for a code. You just introduce the code that is up there. It's very easy. You don't need any password. You don't need to uh, you know, fill in your profile or email. It's very easy. Just go to that uh, menti.com and introduce the code 251637. 
I hope someone is trying to do it because it, I would look foolish in the end if I'm the only guy <laughs> talking about this and nobody does it. If you could please try it. So uh, don't worry, don't do anything yet. So just try to log in. And now while you are responding to that question, I will put the same question to our panel. And in the end, we'll try to confront uh, what you think are the major challenges in VET and what our, sorry? Yes, and, uh, and what the panelists think from their experience of their organizations, some of the organizations you've seen have a global nature, others are more sort of regional, others are more focused on a specific sector like Chains 5. So uh, we will ask the panelists, what is their view of what are the major challenges for VET currently and in the future? But from them, I will ask them, although they'll describe the general context in which we are, to only identify one challenge. So from each of the panels, I'll ask you to identify one, and hopefully not what another person has said. So although you might share that idea that that's the major challenge, I would ask you to come up with a new one. And in the meantime, all of you, if you could please just with one word, don't worry, while we talk, you just put the, what is in your vision the biggest challenge for VET now. That the, the next question we'll have is then what to do about it. But just keep on saying what are your challenges. In the end, we'll see what is uh, your opinion. So I would start maybe by Santiago. Could I ask you, in your view of your experience, you have a lot of members in, in FVET, what is in your view the biggest challenge that we are facing or will face in the near future for vocational education and training? Well, uh, as I know that's the, what the others are going to say, <laughs> I will put it. Uh, I don't know if the, if the biggest one, but for me one of the main challenges, it's related with uh, the fifth uh, Mr. Deliverable in Riga, teachers and trainers. We are in that video you put before and all these three days, <clears throat> we have been listening a lot about uh, innovation, about, uh, about adaptability, about being able to cope with the new challenges. And I think that we have to attract the best teachers to our schools. And that's a real challenge for us. And how to attract them, we talk about attracting a student, but how to attract to have the best teachers and then to give them the right skills like they are doing here in the Basque Country. So teachers and training, how to recruit the best ones. In some countries, it's becoming a real problem to have vet teachers. And then how to train them initially and to assure continuous professional development for them. Thank you, Santiago. Denise, would you like to share your view? Okay, sure. Um, it's easier for us. We're at the beginning, uh, and uh, as you know, we don't know what the others are saying, so we have to prepare for six different challenges. So I will choose one because I'm a biologist and, in fact, an ecologist. So for me, it's sustainable development. Uh, why sustainable development? Because I feel we owe it to the generations that will come after us. In my country, uh, we have uh, uh, indigenous people, and they always talked about whatever you do, you have to think about the seven generations after you. So for me, what is important is really what do we do from a sustainable development perspective in our uh, curriculum? no matter what is the disciplines that we are talking about. Whether we are talking about restorations, whether we are talking about health sector, whether it is architecture, whether it is construction. And so it is basically a way of thinking. And when I say a way of thinking, it's a way of doing, but also a way of being. You remember in the video we talked about the doing uh, by the robots and the being by the humans. So uh, for me, sustainable development is crucial for our society because it will impact our food, the migrations of people, our health, and of course biodiversity. And because of time, I won't enumerate everything. 
But I want to flag the affinity group that the UNESCO, um, UNESCO UNIVOC has uh, centers right now on sustainable development, but we also have an affinity group with the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics that is looking at that to look at how is it that we will all together fight climate change. And so it goes from green campuses, green research, green curriculum, green community, and a green culture. And I would be pleased to talk further on that one. Thank you. Uh, from Chains 5, can we have your idea? What are the big uh, challenges ahead? From the perspective of... Uh... It's working? Okay. This is of uh, level 5. Um, I've had a lot of discussions in the last few years and also here. It's about um, the status and the image of vocational education and training. How stakeholders are looking at vocational education and training. The business world, world of work, also parents, counselors, advisors. So how to make vocational education more attractive. But of course it's attractive, but then the other uh, people know that, that it's attractive. So if we have, think at level five, I think it's very challenging for the Fed providers or the Fed world or in, internationally. We need people at level three, four, more at level five, and maybe, maybe at level six. They need more competences, not maybe the whole spectrum of all the qualifications we have in level five of a full degree. But I think that Fed has the, need the opportunity to offer also level five qualification and not having a competition with higher education, not having an academic drift and not for higher education to have a vocational drift. They can find each other in between in the level five area. So there are business academies, they have, as I said, vocational education training providers. They can work together in a region. So private, public, finance, find each other in the region to cooperate and don't fight each other about the state. Of course, I know counselors and parents, they think about universities. Maybe you need the name, to change the name, etc. But I think that's a real challenge for Fed providers to grow to level five and maybe higher. Please, please go ahead. Go okay. ahead, please. Uh, well, I will try just to build on what she said. So I'm also a very proud uh, vet graduate, uh, and I'm very proud to went through that way. Nevertheless, uh, when we usually talk, yes, of course, we want uh, young people to enter VET, and they, they usually ask, well, how many of your children are in VET? And then usually everybody is quiet. And I'm very proud also that my daughter entered university, and after the first semester, successfully passing all the exams, she came home and said, that's not for me. And she entered a community college. Uh, we were very surprised. Uh, but then she's very happy. And why? Because children nowadays, not only children, even young people, what we miss in them is the drive that they can create, that they can see that they are creating something with their own hands. They usually are stuck in front of the computers, papers, but when they can see that they can create something with their own hands, with their own minds, this is what drives them. This is what really shows them how they can do better. And this is where I come back to the video, you, in the future, the challenge or the challenge of that is that all of us want a different pathway. All of us are completely different. So the system, the educational system will have to change concretely, especially in Europe, offering micro-credentials. So each one of us can take different credentials individually as we want and open our pathways, maybe vocational, higher education, whatever, all through lifelong learning. We see in America a lot of retired people entering education 
It's happening in Europe as well. We are seeing in our community colleges, uh, graduates from masters and bachelors entering just because they want to learn how to do something concrete, how to work really concretely with the world of work. And this is, I think, a big challenge for us, the change of the <laughs> Thank you very much. It's getting more difficult now because almost everything has been said, but Jens, if you can give us your idea. All right, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, from my perspective, I would say uh, we have to put a really strong emphasis on embracing change management in uh, network collaboration. And uh, the reason for it is um, when we look back at the last two days, what we were seeing was basically the, the edge of the industry. You see really where the uh, state of the art is. But we have to bear in mind, and we didn't talk so much about that, that uh, uh, industrial nations are probably close to that, but many countries in the world are quite far from it. So we have to find a way to, to close that gap, and I believe uh, the quickest way of doing that is uh, through network collaboration. I think one very quickly to add, um, there's a, an important quote that I find uh, uh, is worth mentioning uh, from Rosbeth uh, Moss Cantor. She's a professor at Harvard Business School. And she said once, uh, change is disturbing when it's done to us and it's exhilarating when it's done by us. So there, I think, when we're confronted with change, uh, that's actually where we need to make sure uh, that uh, this change becomes exhilarating, especially in places where the gap between the state of the art and the state of practice is large, so that we can make sure uh, it's a pathway that leads to development and not to frustration and stagnation. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Hans. Thank you. Um, many of the things that are already mentioned, but uh, I think there are uh, technical, vocational education and training has been uh, very technical, very based on skills for many years. And I think we need to adapt to also what is evident on the screen to secure that we have a complex acquirement of skills and competencies. And I think that will, along with uh, securing the attractiveness of VET, make sure that we can have the right workforce for our labor market. Even though we'll see jobs change, we need to supply a workforce that is adaptable and agile. One of the key issues I think that we should embrace in VET is migration. We have seen a lot of migration recently, but I think this is just the beginning. We'll see a lot more, also based on what is the climate changes. And one thing that should be aligned is what the UN SDGs are addressing and what the lifelong platform from UNESCO is addressing. So I think we should align these issues to fight for a better future in that sense. Thank you very much. I think that, you know, trying to translate what has just been said and what are the challenges that most people talk about, clearly what comes out more evident over here is adaptability and innovation. Digitalization is there, change in general. Uh, soft skills, we see quite, I think it's not surprising, but maybe what is important to take out of this is that adaptability, the need for VET to provide people with the skills that will allow them to uh, manage the various transitions throughout their lives, I think that's what, this is my interpretation of course, what you are trying to say, so that VET needs to make sure that we are not only providing people with the skills to get a job tomorrow, so especially young people, but also allowing them to manage transitions throughout their lives. And we all know that there's no such thing as job for life any longer. People will have to change frequently because of technological change, because of societal changes, the gig economy, the, the way the content and the way uh, uh, we uh, organize work. And this will, of course, require that the education and training systems are there capable of providing the people to manage these various transitions. Uh, I would just like to ask, does anyone have any question? We'll only have time for one question now. Any question that you'd like to ask any of the panelists in what they've identified as the uh, key challenges. Anyone, a short question you'd like to ask? No? 
Good. So think of a question because we'll have more opportunities. What I'd like now to, to ask you is, I'll put on the next, uh, the next screen asking you to give your uh, opinion. And I've seen that in this, uh, in this first part, when we ask you for the challenges, one of the issues you mentioned is change. Now, what I'd like to ask you is, what is the level of change that you would expect that we are going through right now? I mean, change has been ever since society. There's always been change, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but we've always had change in the evolution of, of humans. What I'd like to ask you is, please give your opinion on what is the pace of change that we are living. Will this just be uh, another, uh, you know, big buzz that I remember when I was in university back in 1980, we were already studying artificial intelligence and everyone was telling us, our professors were telling us that by the end of the century, so 17 years ago, the world will be what we are now saying will be in the next 20 years. So is this just another of these bubbles? Or are we going to just get incremental change, that there will be small changes adapting to digitalization but we're really not talking about, you know, uplifting the whole system. Or do you think it's going to be significant change or disruptive? By disruptive, I mean really, you know, world not being as it used to be, in the sense that uh, the education and training systems, for example, now we all identify what is school education, what is VET, what is higher education, what is adult education, and all of these things are put in nice, neat boxes. But will the future still be like this? Will we still need vocational education and training as it is today? So this is what I'm trying to uh, also uh, give you the opportunity to say when we're talking about disruptive change. And it would be important. I see nobody believes that there'll be no change. This is good. Okay. <laughs> so at least we are attentive to what is happening. Good. And you've seen the video before. So. Uh, in the first one, we had around 125 uh, people responding. So once we reach 125, which we've already reached, I think we'll close this. And you can continue voting. I'll start putting questions to the panelists, but keep on voting. No problem. I think there's a clear winner here. And uh, oh, no change. You see, someone, someone just wanted to prove me wrong. Good. I have friends in the audience, I see. OK. <laughs> Thank you. She's my boss, so she's trying to prove I'm wrong. <laughs> so, fine. I, I will ask the panelists now, and I'll ask uh, once again, because we started our session with a 35 minutes delay, so I suppose the organizers would like me to shorten the 75 minutes, also because I've got the plane to catch in a few minutes. I'd like to ask you, uh, do you think, what do you think of the change coming up? Do you agree with what the audience uh, is saying that we, in the presence of disruptive change, so change as we've never seen before because of artificial intelligence, because of all digitalization, what we've been talking about, will our education system really have to change? And related to this, so your opinion on the level of change, but also as a result of what is being seen here, does VET have a future? And if we do have a future for VET, what can it look like? I know it's difficult for you to answer this in just two minutes, but please do your best. I, this time I'll start with you, Hans, please. Thank you. Um, well, the picture has, it, it's pretty clear from the uh, voting here. And I completely agree with that. But my fear is that we definitely in some countries, for one thing where I come from, we have politicians who are not ready to embrace that kind of change at the moment. We see that some of the political structures are barriers to what will be needed actually to adapt to the future of the uh, workforce. Um, I'm sure that there is a place, a strong place for VET in the future. We can put it the other way around. Can we imagine a world without? Please. Thank you. I think um, I'll go the same route. Uh, of course, uh, there's a future for VET because uh, I think um, with this industry 4.0 and digitalization, uh, a lot of it is about uh, um, uh, th pushing theoretical boundaries, but in the end, we still need to implement it in practice, and that's where, where TVET comes in. Um, when we think back, um, just some very simple thing, water supply in cities. 
More than 2,000 years ago, uh, people in Rome, they built aqueducts to bring water to the cities, even enough to have water plays and fountains and things like that. 2,000 years later, still not everybody on this planet has clean water uh, at home. So, uh, and the development has been dramatic since and it has not stopped. So as long as the human mind is inquisitive, they're going to push boundaries and you will have to transform theory into practice. And that's where TVIT comes in. Thank you, Jens. Please, Denise. Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> so um, is there a future for TVET and what is it? I think there's a great future for TVET. It's the best time to be in TVET, in fact. Uh, the stars are extremely well aligned and it's great when we hear politicians like the politicians that uh, the president and both the deputy minister, the way they talked about TVET, this is a model to, to follow all over the world. Um, for me, uh, when you look at the 17 goals of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, in fact, they are all about TVET. When you look at them, and so I think, wow, this is great. And uh, the best example is when you hear, and because I represent the world, I'll give three short examples around the world. When you know that 600 universities in China are being transformed in polytechnics, it tells you the story. When you know that in Canada, we are uh, TVET, or we never say TVET, by the way, we say professional and technical education and training, uh, but we are becoming the finishing school of graduates from universities. Why? Because they cannot find a job. And uh, we also offer degrees now in our institutions as well as post-grad certificates at the request of the industry because they felt that the universities couldn't answer their needs. Uh, if you look also at the last example, the European Commission that has announced that in fact uh, it will increase by three times the number of students uh, that will benefit from student mobility that are in TV. Wow, this is music to my ear. And I will just finish by saying, when you begin to have universities beginning to talk our language, it means that we are into something. And there's this blurring that is happening more and more because you hear universities talking about competency-based access for all and work-based learning, which are all things that are part of the DNA of our system. So great future for TVET, definitely. Uh, it's, it's consistent. The one who has replied uh, yeah. that no change says no future. It's the person that doesn't like me. It's the guy that <laughs> said there will be no change. Yeah. Uh, is, there a future, is there a future for human beings? If yes, there is a future for VET. VET is about people. If you think about people around you providing you a lot of services, VET is all around. So, of course, there is a future for VET. And the change, as it was uh, shown in the video, the, 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 the question is why? Why the change? And, and the why, in the video said, it's people. We are why? So, some people are afraid of change because change in itself is not good or bad. It's why we do need to change. And we need to change, if you have seen the video that Annette finalized her brilliant presentation, it's about helping people. It's about making more sustainable future for our seven generations. So if there is a future for, for, for human beings, for humankind, it's only possible with VET. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe it's already a little bit sad, but I'd, the, there is no def, real definition of vocational education and training. Every country has its own system. So I think for the future, it's very important to talk on a European level about the system can we harmonize it? So I think, and there will be a disruption. Maybe I'm very pessimistic, but a lot of people also in economics said there will be another crisis. But nobody knows what the effects will be. And I think what the crisis will be and what the effects will be that we need, need people who have a fat background. 
And we also notice that companies are the drivers if they in Germany need young people and healthcare, etc., they go to another country. So there will be more mobility. Erasmus will allow students to be more mobile. And that's also for graduating, completing a program and go to another country, maybe halfway. If you have an associate degree, you can go to a bachelor in another program, another country. So I think that we have to look at harmonizing the system that in countries can go from the other country and have a job or completion of a degree or a program or certificates. So I think that it will be disruptive. But there's a future, but we have to know very carefully what is vocational education and training. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, definitely I think that there is a very good correlation between what you think if the change is needed. If you think no change is needed, probably there's no future for that. But um, I could see that probably all of you are here because you think that there is a need of change. And the uh, more disruptive it is, the better future there is for that. Uh, definitely, it will have to change. It will have to change really deep in, uh, in let us say, my mother generation. Uh, they used to say, you enter employment and you should retire from the same company. If you didn't, they, there must be something wrong with you if you changed uh, so uh, work placements, etc. Nowadays, it was like, if you don't change it every five years, you must be weird, there must be something wrong with you. And not only uh, taking different jobs, but really different professions we enter and the students of the future will like go around, mingle, and change professions and do everything. This is the future of that. Every individual would go its own pathway, and we have to open the doors for it. If we won't, they will go out. They will find another solution for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think it's more or less unanimous except for that uh, person that said no, that that has a future. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is very good for me because I'm working in Brussels and I get my salary because I'm working in VET, so it's good that you don't want to eliminate VET out of the, out of the, the map. Uh, but, I mean, what, what I think we can take out of this, uh, this, these questions that we put forward is that, first of all, there is a future for VET, but VET has to adopt change and we saw in the previous uh, uh, quiz that we did that some people believe it's not only significant change, but it's disruptive change. It's really completely changing the way we think about education and training, and in particular about vocational education and training. And then the big challenges that everyone uh, uh, recognized was the need that VET provides, equips people with the power to be adaptable and adaptable throughout their lives. I think this came out very clear. The need to invest in innovation, that VET is part of the innovation process if we want to become relevant, because if we are just uh, uh, you know, not taking into account the big challenges that are out there, we will naturally be out of the business. So I think we had initially designed this, uh, this panel to last much longer, but I've seen that we've just arrived at the end of our time. I'd just like to, of the 35 minutes I had less, maybe just take 10 minutes to finalize this. Uh, what I'd like to is to take the opportunity, since we are here, we have 46 or 47 countries from all over the world here. The next step I'd like to ask you before we finalize is, what can we do about it? As, you know, people that uh, uh, work in VET, people that have ideas about VET, what can we do? And the question I'd like to put to you, and I'll put it next, and like your vote once again, is if you could please <clears throat> tell us of all you heard today and, you know, all the need that we have for changing experiences, what do you think would be the areas where we could, these international organizations and of your experience, how could we best cooperate among each other? You know, in the European Union, we have Erasmus program, we have uh, a process in which we bring the ministers and all the stakeholders of VET together. So we have a formalized process which is working relatively well. What I'd like you, uh, to ask you is, of these, 
Five options I put here. There could be other options. I just thought of these, but there could be other options. So uh, should we work together in raising the attractiveness, the image and status of VET? Should this be the sort of the key drive force of how we should cooperate in, in throughout the world? Or should it be more achieving cooperation and making the VET systems work together by having more mobility of learners, of staff, of leaders in uh, VET organizations? Or should the skills competitions, you know, world skills, euro skills, there's a lot of skills competitions all over the world, should this be a way of sharing experiences, identifying what the labor market is needing, then have the students competing for those kind of occupations of the future? Should this be the way? Should, oh, I'm very happy to see that. I haven't looked at it yet. Network, have you seen that, Dana? Networks of Excellence and Innovation, good. This is the initiative the Commission is launching right now, and I'm very happy to see this, and I think UNESCO, uh, Shemal, you, you will also mention this because you're working on innovation hubs, and this can also be a way of you know, creating networks throughout the world in which VET institutes get together, try to work in common problems, also share as part of that, uh, those networks, share mobility of learners and teachers and leaders and so on. I'm happy to see that this is very popular. And then the, the fifth option I put is international qualifications. If this could be, you know, in some sectors like the welding sector, there are international qualifications that are out there that are then adopted by the vet center. Should this be the way forward? So I'm very interested in seeing this. I saw that 128 people have already voted. This is excellent, right? I think there's a clear winner, which I love. It was really worth coming to, to, to San Sebastian. It raises my ego. Good. So. <laughs> But what I'd like in the last, then please try to be short because we are out of time already. What would you, as you know, uh, uh, people responsible in your organizations that are working in international level, what would you say should be, I mean, when we go back to Brussels, uh, Dan and I, on what should we be trying to work to make sure that we can all share our expertise, really create a, a world community uh, of uh, people working in vocational education and training. Uh, so I would maybe start by uh, uh, Denise, give the wor word to the ladies first, please. Okay, good. Uh, so there are many things we can do together. So this is a first, I believe. So I think we need to do that uh, more often and we need to make sure we meet together. But one of the things I believe we should really work on is nomenclature. Right now, some mentions TVET, some talks about VET, some talks about career, I forgot what. We talked about professional and technical education and training. Why do we use different languages? We, we are weakening our us. We eliminated uh, VET in our country and TVET 30 years ago because it was seen as pejorative and not uh, important enough. And that's why we eliminated it. But my view would be to change the nomenclature. And I agree with what Hans said earlier with respect to harmonization. It doesn't make sense. We use different names for different things, whether it's certificate, diploma, degree, technical something. No, we should have one language. That's how we would be stronger. And that's how we would be better. And that's how we could make, in fact, a biggest, uh, the biggest impact. Thank you. Uh, Hans, please. Thank you. Of course, I can agree with what is also the outcome of the vote, but I think there is an issue to the international qualifications because that would create some kind of uh, transparency and compatibility. And if you link that to um, listing um, prior learning, we would have a more effective and more transparent system. I think we should somehow work that together. Thank you. Jens. Um, I think um, one of the great important things, uh, of course, the networking aspect is, uh, is very nice for us to see. Uh, I think what we, can, uh, what we should focus on is uh, not only network within certain regions, but also to make sure there's bridging between regions, because we have uh, regions that uh, are at the edge, uh, at the ahead of the curve, and others they seek to, to catch up. So we're trying to, uh, to make that happen. And for, for that to really be effective, I think we need to move to networks of action. 
So it's not only networks of uh, conversation about it and uh, updating us, it's really networks where people and institutions work with each other. Because uh, the challenges are great, but uh, everybody agrees and goes home and uh, then sits there Nothing and says, so done. how do I do this now? And uh, we try to really bring together uh, institutions who want to take a lead role uh, to help others in different regions to practically, practically implement. So for example, teaching materials and new technologies, how do you introduce that into curricula? How do you get people, uh, um, trainers, to understand that it's not only teaching about new technology, but with new technology, about new technology? So this is, I think, the message. Thank you very much. Santiago, like. please. I think that, the, the, apart that, uh, you have sent the link to the Commission for voting for your sort of vocational <laughs> excellence <laughs> network. Uh, if we have that network of, of uh, excellent colleges, I think that we cover some of the other issues as well. Because we rise Correct. attractiveness Correct. and image, so perhaps that's, that's summing up everything. One, one thing that, from our experience in the European network is, Sometimes there are so many people doing things that we don't know, and we start replicating things that in other parts of Europe, of, of the world, have been already done and we don't know. So we have to have more information, more, more exchange that also mobility leads to excellence in that, way, in that way as well. So we have to share more. I think that from my experience, I have been myself 27 years teacher in vocational training school in Spain. And I think that vocational training uh, teachers and people, from my point of view, are the most willing to collaborate, to share best practices, not to be uh, egoistic about what they produce. So let's make the people around the world know what we are doing to share best practice, to, to collaborate, to spread the news, to make us known, to, to feel the passion we put in everything we do. I think that's crucial to collaborate with people ar around the world. Thank you very much. And just on this thing of, of sharing and being willing to share experience, I'd like to really thank uh, Jorge Arrevalo for the incredible work that Technica has been doing and this very I mean, the fact that we're all here, you know, the fact that we can go to Technic and see this, I'm really always amazed by your willingness to share your best practice, your experience, and I just take, before we have the two last speakers, the opportunity to thank you very much for organizing this and for being so generous in the way you share. Thank you. Thanks, please. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, um, I'm not repeating what you are telling, but look at these issues and these topics and I'm happy, really, thanks to the European Commission, that we have now, and you mentioned already, FET for you too. That's now a platform, started in 2010, 2011, to discuss all those issues mentioned here. So we can add some, but this is important to have at an European level also now cooperation between and they also have the interest and uh, the background and the members, etc. But that's the possibility to have it. And the second thing is that Exchange 5 are organizing study trips to the United States and also to Europe. This year they're coming to Europe. If you'll be for two weeks in the United States visiting community college, don't call it a brainwash, but you, life is changing. We did it. We had a lot of members who came with us to Ohio and Michigan and Washington. And they came back and they said, we have to change the system in our country. Thinking from the perspective of the student, 24-7. So maybe if we have this discussion, and Elias said it also, we have a lot of good practices all over the world. The next step can be that we can do more like this and also yeah. and at the World Federation and UNESCO, et cetera. So that's really important. Thank you. You have a big responsibility, the last one to speak, so oh please. My God. Oh my God. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure, just <laughs> telling you, you. Well, <laughs> okay. well uh, I must say that the result also makes me very encouraging and proud because we are just finishing a K3 project on building professional higher education regional centers of excellence 
from policy level downwards, and we are very happy with the results, and it works, and that's why definitely I see the future there. And what I would like to say, instead of reinventing the wheel again and again, what we should do is, if I take the words from our previous speaker, we should be adaptable, agile, resilient. So, governments, commission, offer, give us the platform to be agile, adaptable, resilient, so that we can cover the demands of our society, of our labor market, that we can put the responsibility on the institutions to be like that, and also to have the autonomy to give them a broader knowledge for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, um, just two minutes and you go for your coffee break. Uh, I think, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the panelists for, for sharing your ideas with us. I'm sorry I gave you much less time than initially we had agreed with, but I think we try to make the things a little bit interactive, give you the opportunity to share your views as well. Uh, just before leaving, I'd like to share with you one uh, short video of one minute of my commissioner, my top boss in Brussels, and uh, she would like to show how she sees VET and what we are doing at the European level on trying to raise the attractiveness and improve the status, the social status of VET, the way parents see it, the way teachers see it, the way guidance professionals see it, and that's through the European Vocational Skills Week, which we hope in the future we can link with other Skills Week all over the world, and instead of having a European Vocational Skills Week, we can have uh, something like a, a World uh, Vocational Skills Week or something similar to that, but that's something else. I'm just going to show you a short video of my commissioner uh, in which she's asking all of us to mobilize in favor of VET. Can you please put the, uh, the video? Dear friends of vocational education and training, I am a firm believer that gaining a vocational qualification is one of the best ways to fast track one's career. 80% of VET graduates find a long-term job within six months of finishing their studies. VET helps to close the skills gap in Europe. It is a win-win option for students, employers and society at large. I want to make VET a first choice, both for the young and adults who need reskilling. And the European Vocational Skills Week is a great way to see what VET is in practice and what opportunities it offers. Last year, you organized more than 1,500 events all over Europe as part of the VET Week 2017. It was fantastic. We are now preparing for the 2018 edition of the European Vocational Skills Week, and we count on your participation and input. Bring the week closer to the people. Help us to tell everybody what opportunities VET can offer. Spread the message about excellence in VET. See you in November during the VET Week 2018. Thank you. So, with these, with these wise words of my boss, I would like to thank you all for having participated in this session. Once again, thank uh, Georgia Revallo and the, the Basque authorities for the excellent work they are doing in vocational education. And I think more than the work they are doing, their generosity of sharing these experiences and helping through this way of making VET really a first choice for people all over the world. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a nice travel back home. Thank you.